Come on, man. Even in video games? Horror is one of my favorite media genres. I like horror books, horror movies, and especially horror games. After spending so much time on my last video on a long, complex RPG, I was looking forward to doing a shorter, fun video on a horror game that I could work on to sort of reset before getting back into another big 20 to 30 minute long project. The absolute renaissance that the horror genre has been seeing in other forms of media, with films like Hereditary, Midsummer, and series like The Haunting of Hill House, and even in print media, with stuff like the explosion in popularity of Junji Ito's work, would have you believe that this is the best time ever for the horror genre everywhere. But when I started actually looking around at my options for horror games, I was forced to face something more terrifying than any piece of media could possibly be. That being the current state of horror video games. Horror games are kind of bad right now. Sure, there are some great highlights. For example, we have the Resident Evil 2 remake, which is great, and we have some obvious standouts with horror themes like Bloodborne. But in general, most horror games, like most horror movies, are low effort products that have been recycling the same boring ideas for years on end. If you watch a horror movie, it's dumb teenagers getting bamboozled by a generic horror movie villain. And if you play a horror game, it's a nameless protagonist getting bamboozled by a physics engine someone spent thousands of hours programming so you can realistically open a door. So now the question is, how did we manage to get ourselves into this mess? Why did Five Nights at Freddy's get four sequels? What is Jacksepticeye so afraid of? Christ! Already? Already, Freddy? Oh my god, that was fucking terrifying! And are there any good games left in the horror genre? Well, to answer all of that, we need to go all the way back to the year the internet was invented, 2010. In 2010, a game came out. A game called Amnesia The Dark Descent. This game scared the shit out of everyone, and it was incredible. It's hard to believe from where we are standing now that this type of game was at one point a fresh, new experience. I played it alone in the dark with headphones on, and the choir section almost hospitalized me. Every streamer was playing it, every Let's Player was playing it, and with every gamer bro jump scare overreaction, Amnesia's power only grew. What the fuck? Oh my god! Oh! Oh no 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 no! Oh fuck! The idea of a horror game was completely redefined. Where once we had games like Resident Evil 2 or Eternal Darkness, and a lot of more borderline titles like Fear, now we have Outlast, Layers of Fear, and a never ending torrent of horrific asset flips like Slender that print money faster than Raid Shadow Legends sponsorships. This relatively new concept for a horror game is defined by a couple of key tenets. Immersive controls where the player manually interacts with the environment in a first-person perspective, puzzle solving, and a powerless player character that needs to run from any physical encounter faster than I run from emotional commitment in real life. There are dozens of games that follow this formula. Here are a few I've collected over the years, and this is just scratching the surface. Some of them are even pretty good, like Soma for example, which has some of the best writing of any game in recent years, let alone a horror game. But this doesn't change the fact that it's starting to get tired. Nothing makes me drop a game faster than realizing it's an amnesia clone with no additional qualities. I lasted less than an hour in Outlast, not because it was too scary, but because playing Outlast feels like taking four sleeping pills and trying to watch full house reruns without slipping into a coma. I think it's important to realize that many of these games aren't only developed to be played, they're developed to be watched. 
it's now equally as important to develop a horror game that gives Markiplier a little spook live on camera than it is to develop a horror game with some sort of unique idea or vision. If it isn't fun to play, who cares? Because if it's fun to watch, you'll get a legion of middle schoolers lined up around the block to play the same game their favorite streamer is currently playing. Just like cheap, shitty horror movies generate stacks of money, so do cheap, shitty horror games. So what's the real incentive to fire up your brain and come up with some good stuff? Yeah, you could develop a complex, tense combat system with spooky enemy design and scary set pieces and scary sound design, but why do that when you can just slap a first person camera onto a scene and code one button to be the game's context sensitive interaction button? The controller for these games could literally look like this, or, or I guess this if you're playing on PC. I am by no means a professional level programmer or developer but I can tell you with absolute confidence that something like Slender could be made in a weekend by literally anyone watching this video. These concepts are spectacularly low effort. One of the biggest lines of defense against modern horror games is the idea that the player needs to feel powerless, because otherwise the game isn't scary. And in order for the player to truly feel powerless, any idea of a combat encounter or any interaction beyond running or trying to figure out some obscure puzzle need to be completely removed from the game. This is completely and totally incorrect. I even did a video a long time ago where I took a look at Witch Hunt, which is a masterclass in allowing the player to fight back in a horror game without making the game any less scary. Even games like Dusk, which are completely focused on an action-oriented experience, and creating a total video game power fantasy can have their moments where they are absolutely terrifying. Resident Evil 4 is basically an 80s movie starring Leon Kennedy, and everyone was pissing their cargo shorts over the regenerators. I would argue that making the player feel powerless by completely taking away any ability to do anything besides walk and fiddle with desk drawers is not only not the most effective way to make the player feel powerless, but also the laziest imaginable option. It gets used as a crutch to avoid more complex design pretty regularly. These games are also obsessed with the idea that the player needs to be scared all the time, which they also achieve through the laziest possible method, the timeless jump scare. This might be a bit of a controversial statement, but a horror game doesn't necessarily need to scare you to be good. There is an execution of tone and theming that is equally as important as making PewDiePie pretend to be scared for his 10-year-old fans. That's why a movie like Midsummer, which is actually a bright, colorful, and not really traditionally scary movie, still works as a horror film. It executes on a tone and an atmosphere that create discomfort over the course of watching the movie. Games can do this too. But this isn't really a video essay on the horror genre, I mean, it kind of is, but I also have a review for you today. So let's take a look at an actually interesting horror game. The game is called World of Horror. And yes, I have once again violated my blood oath by making a video on a game that is still in early access. But these are the measures I need to take nowadays to see justice done to the genre. World of Horror is a game with a few stated goals. To try to pay homage to classic adventure games from the 80s, pay homage to horror manga artist Junji Ito, and pay homage to famed lunatic and sometimes author H.P. Lovecraft. And it succeeds in all of these goals easily. 
The first question you have looking through the game's screenshots and Steam footage, and thinking about the game's description, is okay, but does this 1-bit style really do a good job at setting the atmosphere of this game? Is this really gonna work? Oh yeah, I guess it does. I'll get into some more analytical stuff soon, but for now let's go over World of Horror's actual gameplay. On its face, the concept seems very simple. It's a pretty faithful emulation of classic adventure games. You choose choices, the choices have consequences, and if you fail you start over. But there is a degree of randomness thrown in to make sure each playthrough is a little different from the last, and there are some built-in complexities. At first, the game's UI and menus seem a little confusing, so let me explain some of that so you can tell what the fuck you're even looking at with some of this footage. Or so if you end up buying the game after watching this video, you can go in with a little bit better of an understanding. This is the new game menu. You've got some difficulty options over on the side, and you've got four options for what kind of a new game to start. The first one here is just sort of a tutorial that walks you through some of the game's basics, with one of the game's 12 mysteries. You're gonna wanna play this a couple of times to figure out how the game functions on a basic level. Next, you have this option, which is the standard, normal playthrough of the game. This is the one you wanna play most of the time. I'll get to these next two options after I explain some of the normal playthrough's concepts. In a standard run of World of Horror, your objective is to get all five keys to unlock the lighthouse, so you can climb to the top and stop the Elder God from slam dunking the earth into a giant basketball hoop, or whatever. In order to do this, you need to solve all five randomly selected mysteries currently taking place in your small seaside Japanese town. Each time you solve a mystery, you get a key. This is your home menu, where you start the game, and where you will return after surviving an investigation. From here, you can take a bath for a small stat bonus, or start a new mystery. You can also mess around with some cosmetic options if you want. And there's not much going on here, so let's get into solving the mysteries, which is the actual game a part of the game. Like I mentioned before, each run of the game features five randomly selected mysteries from the pool. Some of these are harder than others, and sometimes you can find items in one mystery that can help you out in another. Usually I would give you more specific examples than that, but this game is a little more susceptible to spoilers than most games, so I'm trying to stay a little bit lighter on them than usual. The more attempts you make, and the more times you get horribly mangled by Junji Ito-style abominations, the better you will be at strategically choosing which mysteries to solve in which order. Most mysteries take place in the game's town, and while you're in town, your investigation screen is going to look like this. Up here are where updates and story information on your current investigation go. Down here are the locations you can visit. Every area can be investigated, but several areas have additional actions that can be taken. For example, in the downtown area, you can choose to go to the store and try to shop for certain items, or go to the police and try to get them to actually do something for once. The goal is always to investigate whichever area is circled on the list, and doing so will move the mystery forward until it is eventually solved, or until your character dies, which happens when their reason or stamina drops below zero, or the doom meter hits 100%. This seems like a simple concept, but there is a deceptive amount of strategy that goes on here. Most actions in the game will raise your doom meter. Doom is basically a measurement of time. The more time your character wastes, the closer they come to inevitable doom. Do you want to try and shop at the store for some utility items like the flashlight? That's going to cost doom. Do you want to try to buy a new weapon at the hardware store? This will also cost doom. Want to try and recruit some allies at the local high school? I think that's illegal, but it also costs doom. You are in a constant balancing act between your doom meter and every other resource available to you, of which there are several. Stamina and Reason act as your life bars, but they're also a resource that can be expended in certain situations. For example, if you get this random event where you find a dead police officer, you can choose to investigate the body, 
which will give you experience. Or maybe you decide that it's worth it to steal the gun and lose a bit of your reason. If you gain enough experience, you can level up the way you would in most games, but you can also spend your experience to achieve certain goals. For example, when you're in the schoolyard recruiting allies, they won't join you unless they're scared. In order to scare them, you need to tell them a scary story about what's going on in town. Doing this will cost you 5 experience. Finally, you also have your funds, which act as your money. Buying items from any of the game's three stores and going to the hospital are all going to cost you money. And some random encounters will also give you the option to spend funds. Between all four of these resources, you've got a lot of decisions to make. And as you play through the game, you'll start to memorize a lot of the encounters and figure out what the most efficient choice to make at any given time is. Figuring out this overarching puzzle is the main appeal of World of Horrors gameplay. You also have your character stats, which you can raise by buying certain items, recruiting certain allies, or by choosing certain perks when leveling. These stats are important for passing skill checks during encounters, similar to how you would expect in a tabletop RPG. Different characters have different sets of starting stats, and these also need to be managed. You need to make sure you're getting enough stat bonuses, especially for the end of the game, which requires several difficult skill checks. So you can more or less pile these on top of all the other resources you need to be keeping track of. A few mysteries will take place in or lead to different settings from the town. They have completely different rules. Usually these will isolate you from being able to visit stores or the hospital, and a couple will even prevent you from resting to regain stamina and reason. As you solve mysteries, you will learn which ones are which, and that's a huge part of deciding which mysteries to solve first. Now that we have a general idea of how strategizing works in terms of investigations, let's look at the combat system. Combat in World of Horror is turn-based, as I'm sure a couple of you guessed already, and it has the same kind of problems you would generally expect from a turn-based combat system. To make an attack, you select actions that fill up your action bar, then you click the attack button and cross your fingers. But this isn't completely devoid of interesting choices. Depending on which weapon you have, which character you're playing, and which perks you picked while leveling, trying to figure out the most efficient way to spend your turn requires a little bit of brain power. Usually this just involves dodging and then trying to figure out the best attack pattern. Don't expect too much out of the combat at its face. Of course, if a fight is too hard, you can always just run, which will add 5 doom to your doom meter. The combat in World of Horror isn't very interesting if you look at it through the lens of a combat system, but if you look at it through the lens of resource management, it actually performs a pretty good role in the game. For every fight you win, you'll get experience, and sometimes an item. The question always is, is it worth dropping my stamina and reason in this fight for experience, or is it worth it to just take the doom increase and run? There are also certain unavoidable boss encounters that can't be escaped. So here the game becomes, what can I do to make sure I have enough resources to survive this encounter? Do I solve a mystery without a boss fight first and try to get items and allies, or do I just fight the boss first while I have full health and reason? It's boring combat, but it's excellent resource management. So if that's the kind of thing you like in games, then you'll like this. We also have a magic system in World of Horror. You can cast spells by paying their cost at any time, but some of them only have an effect if they're cast in combat. The spells operate on the same kind of resource system the rest of the game does, and usually involve trading one resource for another, or spending reason to gain some sort of an ability that will help you on your current investigation. The spell system needs some balance work. In my many runs of World of Horror, I didn't find very many useful spells, and the costs usually outweighed the benefits. However, when you do find a good spell, like this one, it can be make or break in terms of your survival. This basically covers a standard run of the game in terms of gameplay, but if you remember the title screen, there are two more options. The quick play option is an almost fully randomized playthrough of the game. In a standard game, you will always play as this character, but in a quick play game, your character will be randomly selected. The god you're trying to stop will also be randomly selected. 
Each character has different starting stats, different starting items, and different perks to choose while leveling, and each god will have different negative effects on the world. Between the characters being random, the mysteries being random, and the god being random, quick play can lead to some pretty difficult situations, which is why I wouldn't recommend playing quick play games until you've actually survived a normal run once or twice. Finally, we have the customized run, which is where this game is really capable of hitting its full potential. I say capable because the custom games really showcase how much of this game is unfinished. The first thing you're going to see when you select a custom game is this screen, which is asking you to select card packs. I know you're probably confused because I haven't mentioned cards once in this entire video, and you're worried this is about to be some Hearthstone bullshit, but all cards are in this game is anything that appears on this part of the screen. Items are item cards, allies are ally cards, injuries are injury cards. The idea is that if everything works as set of cards, the game will have a modular setup that makes it easy to update and easy to mod. In fact, this game already has mod support for people to add custom content. The simplicity of this system is one of the reasons that I expect this game to actually leave early access at some point. Once you've selected the cards, you can enter a world seed or select a random one. Then you get to this screen where you can choose your character and character background. Then you choose which god you were trying to stop. There are a handful of other options here I didn't go over, but the point is, this game mode and the idea of the card system could potentially lead to some pretty wild combinations and a pretty insane amount of content. Especially if this game manages to pick up a dedicated community and people start modding in additional card packs on their own. This covers World of Horror's gameplay, but if you remember the game's stated goals, this is only one part of the puzzle. The other part is paying homage to Junji Ito and Lovecraft through the game's writing and art style. I'm not going to spend very much time talking about Lovecraft because we all know how he works at this point. We all understand Elder Gods, the existential dread, and the body horror of Lovecraft. There doesn't need to be four more minutes of content explaining Lovecraft on the internet. I will, however, spend a little bit of time talking about Junji Ito. Junji Ito is a prolific horror manga artist, even if you don't know who he is by name, I can almost guarantee you that you've seen some of his more infamous work posted around the internet. He has a very striking and immediately identifiable art style. This art style is replicated to an incredible degree in World of Horror. I'm not really sure who the artist is for this game, or how many people are involved with its development, but whoever they are, they have absolutely nailed the aesthetic of Junji Ito's work to the wall. There is something about this lower fidelity pixel art that seems to lend itself better to the atmosphere of a horror game. There's this weird paradox where the lower quality something looks, the scarier it is. Remember earlier when I said Dusk has some terrifying moments? Part of that is because Dusk looks like this. When you're playing a horror game and it has highly produced visuals like Dead Space 2, something about it just stops being scary. This opening scene is impressive from a, a technical, artistic standpoint, but is it really that scary? I'm not sure. At their best, you don't want horror games to look like something you bought off Steam. You want them to look like something you found on a CD in an abandoned warehouse. World of Horror pulls off this look while simultaneously being full of extremely talented art. This is all very impressive. Aside from being a love letter to Junji Ito and Lovecraft and adventure games, World of Horror is also a love letter to horror folklore in general, especially Japanese folklore. There's a bunch of references to not only Junji Ito's work, but references to Japanese folklore in general, like the Scissor Lady, and a few more. Junji Ito himself even has a cameo in the game. Also, I'm pretty sure this is a reference to The Rock for some reason, not sure what the deal is with that, but I guess this picture is pretty fucking scary. The soundtrack is also good. You've been listening to it for the entire video. The music is basically sorcery to me, so just listen to it for yourself and see what I mean.
If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. Leaving a like and a comment also help out. You should also follow my Twitter so you don't miss any important updates. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.